think about what is soft and what is loud and what certain components need to be those things to communicate what you're trying to say. And never, ever, ever play anything that doesn't have some dynamic arc. You know, here comes a fill and you go, okay, let me search through my grab bag. Well, I got this Vaquero one, that was pretty cool. Well, this was, I saw Weckl do that. Oh, that's right. Thomas Lang did that, you know, and then you, <laughs> yeah. and you, and you insert it right up the rear end of the song. Buddy. Thank well you. Done. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Russ Miller. Hello, hello.
Yeah, you have graced us with your presence on Drumio, and I'm so thankful. We've, we've talked about this for a while, all the time at NAM and uh, throughout with Mapex and all that. So I'm so glad you're actually here, buddy. I am glad to be here. Thank you. And it was a long time. We kind of went back and forth on it. So yeah, yeah. Well, beat, we beat the schedule into submission and got here and <laughs> did it. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, we were talking about what to teach today. Russ, you had so many ideas. Like I said, we could have you in here as a residency for like a month and, and teach a new lesson every single day with you. Well, yeah, thank you. I mean, it's uh, over the years doing all the books and DVDs, you sort of build up a catalog of stuff to say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. anyway, I'm glad to be here. Cool. To it. And if you haven't seen Russ yet, obviously he's got some books, some DVDs, he's done lots of videos online too, but he's also recorded to so many, so many great uh, artists and, and not only that, but TV shows, movies, like you're a working drummer, man. Yeah, you know, it's been a lot. You know, I always tell everybody that I've had the opportunity to kind of do everything I ever wanted to do, you know, <laughs> in little pieces. You know, I was a, in, I was a rock star for a minute when I was in the Psychedelic Furs, and you yeah. know, I've been a side man with so many people, and then, of course, playing on American Idol and being on the the house band TV show thing, yeah. I mean, all that stuff. It's been really, it's been really great. I mean, sometimes I wish I was just. In Rush, and you know, it was like <laughs> the, the same band for yeah. 40, 40 some years, and then to see what would happen, you know, doing that. But uh, it's been a it's been a lot of fun, and it, and it's allowed me to play a lot of music, big and, time. Yeah, and, and experience a lot of things. So you're a very versatile drummer. Um, for example, like you mentioned you did. American Idol set for quite a while. You've recorded the the, the Continuum TV show, I have, yeah. along with a bunch of other shows. Filmed and right here, <laughs> filmed in Vancouver yeah. too. Um, you played with Nelly Furtado. You played with the Psychedelic Furs, Hillary Duff, Steve Perry, and Andre Bocelli, uh, Ray Charles, Tina Turner. Like the list is is massive. That's just <laughs> scraping the surface. Um, but we got a lot of stuff to talk about. So I'm going to briefly uh, introduce everything here, and then we'll get right into it. Um, first off, a huge thanks to Mapex. Dave Lawrence is sitting back there, and um, the kit that you're playing on is really cool. It's brand new. I can't talk about it. Um, I'm not allowed to. Yeah, neither, but am, I, neither am I. Neither are you. <laughs> but some pretty cool things. Just take a look at it and decipher what you can from it. Um, but it's going to be, more information is coming out in the end of the year. Yeah. Uh, but it sounds amazing. Um, yeah, it's an incredible instrument. One of the best I've ever played, period, in my really? life. Really? Yeah. It sounds great. I can't. I wish I could talk about it, but just you'll, you'll hear more about it soon. But thanks to Remo as well, Zildjian, Vic mm -hmm. Firth, and all the cats. Um, yep. It makes it great and when you guys help us out and uh, everyone wins. So Absolutely. If you want to follow Russ online, please go to his website, russmiller.com. You can also find him on Facebook, at official Russ Miller. And then Instagram, which is at RMI Sticks. That's right. At yeah. RMI Sticks. So make sure you follow him. Give him a like. Give him a, a, a shout out and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you always have new things coming out. And yeah. you're always working with some pretty cool artists and companies too, doing some cool stuff. So yeah, I've been a lot. I've been really involved in a lot of R and D over the years. Yeah. And we were talking earlier. I, I don't know exactly how many, but it's like 75 or 80 products with a bunch of companies. A lot of stuff. I mean, some of them have my name on it, which is obvious, but some of them don't, you know? Yeah, well, I didn't it, know you were designing, help design the Yes system for Yamaha's original Back mounting. in the day, yeah. That's crazy. The vintage wood hoops and all that stuff, yeah. Yeah. So you're a legend, man. You're a legend. And the, the <laughs> old, le old is the term you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll call you a legend. Um, becoming a musician, not just a drummer. This is something that um, I've been thinking about a lot, too, and uh, there seems to be this common thread. We get all these great instructors that come out, and we always teach a certain topic, but there's always this common thread about... I would call it the problem with modern drummers these days. Okay. Yeah. Um, and when you came and you had this great idea, it felt right in line with that. So tell us a little bit briefly about what, what this topic means. Well, you know, my friend Billy Sheehan and I, uh, a, a while back, were talking about this. And, you know, I, I feel like uh, my generation of players, uh, we grew up playing uh, in bands a lot and playing music a lot. That's all we did. I mean, just 100,000 horrible gigs, good gigs, mm -hmm. bar mitzvah and a cruise ship and a wedding and a house band and a, you know, in somebody's backyard and it just, it was playing a lot of different music and, and you, and, and through my career, like you mentioned, you know, I've had the opportunity to play a lot of different styles and things. But there's a common element that, that runs through all of it, in my opinion, and that's the ability to execute music on a high level. Mm -hmm. You know, there's basic things like communication with other players, but there's also an understanding of what the components of playing music are all about. And some of those components uh, not only are different than playing the drums, but some of them are even contrary to playing the drums. Mm -hmm. Like we were talking about with sustain, 
and things that are difficult to execute on this instrument, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I, I always say that, you know, this is a 32nd note, it's a 16th note, it's a quarter note, <laughs> it's a half note, <laughs> yeah. it's a whole note, right? It's all the same uh, the tap on our drums, and then we, we, theor we theoretically wait around for the right amount of time after that to play the next one, and that signifies what kind of note it is, right? Mm -hmm. But um, if you were playing another instrument, for instance, like say saxophone or something, you would be responsible to play that sustain. That changes your uh, ear and it changes your concept of what's happening in music. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're referring to and what I've seen a lot you know, in, in recent years is a lot of guys not playing in ensembles, not mm -hmm. playing with other people, playing by themselves, recording a lot um, in, at home which is great and it's an, an incredible opportunity to, to look at what you're doing and, and really hone in and focus on problems and things like that. But at the end of the day, you know, this is all about communication. Mm -hmm. This is communication, it's a language. And uh, you have to learn how to communicate through ear. And um, you know, we, we always talk about music being a language, but I refer it very directly to being a language. Like for instance, if you, you're speaking Italian or Spanish or something, you can never speak those language if you don't hear it spoken to you. Mm -hmm. You can't just read it and sound Italian or sound Spanish, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. You have to hear it. So that's one really important thing is listening to a lot of different music and, and spending time really listening to what do the components of music are um, because that is the language and the communication. So it's, I, I mean, the, the basic, thing about that is guys will come up and say, well, I want to learn how to play swing, you know, or jazz, and I'll go, great, what are you listening to? Well, I love Tool, and I love, your, you know, <laughs> and you go, look, I love Tool too, Dan Danny's awesome, and the band's great, but, you know, you're listening to Spanish trying to learn, uh, uh, you know, Portuguese, Yeah. you know, and it's two different languages. Yeah. You have to learn to listen to these things. So, do you want to learn how to play swing just because you think it's cool or it's harder? Or do you, and you just despise the music mm -hmm. and don't even want to listen to it? You have to ask yourself those questions. But at the end of the day, my point is, we want to learn how to play music and not the drums. So we want to think about um, what we're doing in a form of uh, language, communication, which, in, which basically boils down to vocabulary, right? Mm -hmm. You have to have enough things to say to have a conversation with somebody. It's the same thing here. Mm -hmm. And we want to do that in a way where we build facility or we build assets that are musical and able to be used in a musical way, not just drumming assets, right? Because drumming assets can be very physical, right, left, right, right, left, left, right, right, fast double bass, fast chops, a lot of things here, you know, whatever's going on, that's all great and I'm into that and I love all of it and I've certainly worked on a lot of it, but the point is you still have to get those core fundamentals. Right? If you can do all that stuff but can't play a really good feeling Brazilian samba or groove or something, then it's all for naught. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, no one wants to hear, hear a drum solo besides another drummer. Right? Right, right. No one in the band cares. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> Most of the audience goes and gets a hot dog when there's a <laughs> drum solo. You know, but uh, anyway, so cool. that's what I want to talk about. Awesome. So we've got a, a great lesson planned. There's no sheet music because it's about becoming a musician. Um, there's a cool play along. Make sure you download it. It's a, it's a rearrangement of a, of a very popular Sting song, which you're going to be playing. Yeah. And uh, you're also going to be playing a couple other tunes, too, that kind of reinforce this whole concept. So take it away, man. Yeah. So, you know, what I wanted to show you, I'll, I'll give you a really good example example of some things. Um, uh, hearing the tonality or the timbre of something, meaning if it's high pitched, if it's low pitched, that's very simple, right? Uh, if I want to play something with a guitar or a trumpet, I can hit a splash cymbal, a snare drum, a hi-hat, something that articulates or exemplifies those sort of pitches or a floor tom with a trombone or a bass, or a bass drum with a bass guitar, everybody knows. But there, it's a little bit deeper than that. It's about understanding um, two major points. One is sustain on the instrument, um, which we don't do like I demonstrated earlier. You know, mm -hmm. the, the instrument just doesn't naturally do for us. Mm -hmm. So we have to do one of two things. Either learn how to play it or learn how to hear it without playing it. And those are very important. So one of the ways that I demonstrate this is... Um, with the use of the brushes, okay? So this isn't necessarily a brush lesson, but um, 
we're gonna use it for a demonstration. So for instance, if I play a, uh, you know, this is a, a whole note, or this is a quarter note. One, two, three, right? Tap, wait, tap, wait, tap, wait. Mm -hmm. But with the brushes, I become responsible for the sustain. And I think that's the hardest part about these. You know, right. got, you know, yes, there's movements and you gotta learn how to you know, do these side swipes and all this. But at the end of the day, I think the most difficult part of the brushes for everybody is the fact that all of a sudden that quarter note becomes one, two, three, four, one. So now right. I'm responsible to play that whole thing as if I was a horn player or a guitar player, right? So that does something in my brain. It, it allows me to hear the proper amount of that space between the notes. So what usually happens here, and, and you'll find yourself doing this, is you get very uncomfortable with the space, hmm. right? Right. So, um, and we, you know, do this once, we'll do it. And if you're at home, please do this with us. I'll give you a great example, we'll do it very quickly. Okay. So we're clapping our hands like this. Okay, that's easy. Yep. Okay, now we break it down to do this. Still pretty easy, mm -hmm. right? And we do this a quarter notes. There's a tiny bit now of insecurity in there. There is. Like, where is that coming in at? I'm watching your hands. Yeah, you're watching my hands. You could tap your foot, maybe it'll help you, right? But now we do this. Now there's a real, when is the next one about to happen? Mm -hmm. I think it's here. <laughs> I think <laughs> yeah. it's here, yeah. right? And the more space there is, right? Yeah. Now turn around and not watch me. Oh, I was off. Ah! <laughs> right, I'm tapping my foot and subdividing. Anyway, that's a great little demonstration of where you have to stop hitting and waiting, but you have to fill that space either physically with something like the brushes or conceptually in your brain. So one way to practice this is just to take the brushes. Let's, you don't, you're just a brush owner, you're not a brush player. <laughs> okay, there's a lot of brush owners. All right, I was a brush owner for many years. Yeah. There's a big difference between a brush owner and a brush player. But what you can do is it, just play eighth notes. Put your click on, click, 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 click. And instead of playing click, 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 like this, make the entire eighth note with the brush. Da, 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 right, there's a length to it. There's even a length to a 16th note. Da, 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 It's not tick, 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 tick. That's something that gets developed from drummers with the, you know, all the metronomes. We hear it as tick, 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 but it really is da, 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 da. What happens is, when you start to hear it like that, da, 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 all of a sudden your time gets so much better because you're not doing what we were doing earlier, which is hit, wait, I think it's here, wait, I think it's here, right. You're hearing that length happen and it's filling that space for you, okay? So there's a couple different ways to work on that. Put on the metronome, just work through some of those subdivisions with the brushes. Triplets, triple, triple, triple. I'm doing like a back and forth alternating, sure. but you don't have to do that. You can just go triple, triple, triple. Just make the length. Triple, triple, da 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 Right? right? You can kind of hear the pulse in there. So what happens is you start to hear time go by with those spaces filled up. And you don't have the desire to fill them up with notes everywhere, right? Right. And that's, that's where this sort of stuff comes in. When you go to play a groove, you know, who can play a groove like this anymore where they just go, Everybody wants to go. Right. 
and you're filling those subdivisions in to make yourself more comfortable. <laughs> yes, it does create a little motion and that's important from time to time, but sometimes that motion is not necessary. Hmm. You know, right. if you, like say you're playing an old blues tune, then a one, two, three. Okay, to not. It's okay to not have that that galloping space filled in something like that. Anyway, this is the the part of the lesson. So subdivisions, learning the lengths, doing yeah. that. The next step is to immerse yourself even farther into the composition by listening to key components of what's happening around you. I think one of the biggest problems with uh, drummers nowadays is they, they have this concept of the band's gonna play the song and I'll play the beat for them. Right. Right. So I'll play the beat, Perfect. I'll play the yeah. time, they'll play the song. Yeah. I don't know what's going on in the harmony, I don't know what's going on in the melody, I'm not even sure what's going on in the lyrics. Sometimes I don't even know. I know guys that don't even know the lyrics to the songs, they've been in the band for 10 years. You know, <laughs> I don't listen to the lyrics. You know. Totally, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, you mentioned some of the singers that I played with, but one of the things that I do, and I learned it from Steve Gadd years ago, I, when I track something with a vocalist, I only have, like, let's say there's a click, mm -hmm. I only have the click and the lead voice in my cans, you know, and maybe some piano. Because every single thing that I play, I want to work with that vocal, right? The paramount thing is that they're telling a story and I can't do anything to interfere with that. So if I play a, a groove or a fill that makes it difficult, harder for them to sing rhythmically, I'm failing. Mm -hmm. If I play something exciting when he's lyrically saying something depressing, <laughs> yeah. you know, then that doesn't make any sense. Right. You know, am I cognizant of those kind of things? But let me give you a really quick example. This is a great way to learn about articulation and learn to how to, to sink yourself into a, a tune a little deeper. Um, again, we'll use the brushes. You know, take some basic um, the jazz standard songs, like, like let's say Beyond the Sea. You know, Beyond the Sea is a classic. And it, you know, if you don't know that, it's the end credits and Finding Nemo. You can listen to it there. But <laughs> Beyond the Sea is like a jazz standard. Okay. And what you're going to do is just take that melody, and I just want you to take the brushes. Again, you're a brush owner, not a brush player. It doesn't matter. You're going to just play that melody in its entirety. Just the vocal part. Okay. So I'll just sing the melody. A one, two, it goes like this. A one, two, three. Boom, ba, ba, da, boo, ba. Now you see I'm playing short notes. Ba, 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 do, ba, long note. Ba, ba, do, ba. Ba, 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 right? Short, short, long. Ba, ba, do, ba. Ba, 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 ba. Okay. Cool, yeah. So, now you can do that with anything. You can play it, you know, for Tom Sawyer, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Today's Tom Sawyer, me, me, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can do it with anything. Just, just take some songs that you know the lyric to and the melody and just play the melody. Now, there's a couple reasons we're doing that. Okay. One, I want you to know what the rhythms for the melody is. I want you to know what the articulation is, meaning... Where's the short and where's the long notes? I want you to hear where the dynamics are. Where's the bigger notes and the smaller notes, you know? Mm. And that's a great exercise to just work through things like that, just using the brushes, okay? Right. Yeah. And then the next step, really quickly, because we don't have a lot of time, but I'll give you a great example how to just move that into the next part. So we take those two components of knowing the composition and being involved in the composition and being the drummer mm -hmm. who keeps time and helps support the ensemble. Now we combine those together. So we're not just the drummer and we certainly can't just be you know, playing the melody. Somebody's right. already doing that. Yeah. We have to put them together. So let's take a basic like Beyond the Sea, that's a basic little swing beat. So here's the swing beat in brushes, and we won't get into all that for now. It's a whole nother lesson, but, you know. Okay. It's basically quarter notes with a little skip on it. Okay, there's my time. Now, 
Here's my drummer part. Now I'm going to go and play the composition with the band. One, two. Uh, now what I'm going to do is, when there's a long note, I can either play that with the band or I can go back to playing time again. But all the rest of the time, I'm just going to play the melody. Okay? So I'm playing the melody just like I was. And when there's a long note, sometimes I play the time, sometimes I can play the note. And, this, and I can do that however I want. A one, two, beyond the sea. Ba-do-ba, play the time. Ba-do-ba, play the note. Ba-do-ba, play the time. Beautiful. All right. Yeah, I see where you're getting at. You, so, so you see what's happening there is I'm, this is with brushes and it's with a jazz song, but this can translate to everything that you're doing on the drums. Hmm. You know, where do you articulate the melody? Do you know if it's short? Do you know if it's long? Do you know if it's high? Do you know if it's low? Mm -hmm. And how do you get those sounds out of the drums and then support the band like you're supposed to, but be involved in the composition? Right. And that's sort of the approach to it. That's the musical, musician side of it. Whereas it before you said, I'm just gonna play time to this song. You also talked about um, chops. A lot of times drummers will learn a certain beat and they'll try it instead of fi finding, uh, instead of creating something for the song, they'll find a place to put that chop that they learned. Well, that's the, that's the problem with learning a specific fill mm -hmm. or a specific chop is that you, um, you know, you, you, you put that in your grab bag and then you're playing a song and then, you know, here comes a fill and you go, okay, let me search through my grab bag. Well, I got this Picaro one. That was pretty cool. Well, this was, I saw Weckl do that. Oh, that's a, Thomas Lang did that. You know, and then you, <laughs> yeah. and you, and you insert it right up the rear end of the song, you know, yeah. like at no cost to anyone, you know, it's just, yeah. I know this, Phil, you're gonna hear it. Yeah. You know, I learned it all week, you're gonna hear it all week, or whatever. I'm a great drummer, check this out. Right, yeah. and there's a lot of times where, you know, I see guys uh, do that, and you go, what? you know what, here's the thing, it was an amazing Phil, and, and it was it's really cool uh, physically, and all of those things, but because of the failure in maturity, mm. and the, the failure for the language, and the vocabulary, and the communication, what we were trying to do, it becomes worthless. That's the problem. So there's nothing wrong with having those things. I, I love having facility on the instrument and being able to have an unlimited vocabulary of things, but mm -hmm. you know, you just have to do it in the right way. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, during the courses, I think we're gonna discuss um, developing that, developing facility, what I call yeah. an open-ended vocabulary or uh, open-ended facility. So it's, it's the ability to play all those things that you wanna play all those amazing gospel chops or any of that stuff, but breaking it down in a way where it becomes open-ended and able to be used with the music's cue hmm. and not with this particular lick. Yeah. You know, you have, to, you have to figure out what that lick comprises and then build a system to utilize it musically rather than just go, here's that lick. I love it. You know. We're gonna be teaching that on a course inside of Drumeo, um, which is gonna be really cool. In fact, we were tossed up, like which one do we do that one for the live lesson or this one? Right, right. But I think we, I think we chose the right, right, right approach here. I hope so. Do you wanna play the song that we're offering as a download for all you guys watching the lesson here? And so we can get an idea of what you mean. Um, yeah. And then tell the listeners what they should be listening to and what they should be focusing on as, as they see you play this. Well, we discussed playing another piece from one of the Arrival albums, which is called, uh, it's, a Fields, it's called Fields of Gold, because it's a Sting song, but it's a complete rearrangement right. of the song. So I chose that one because it has the brush thing and we were talking about it a little bit, but um, what you're gonna hear in there is how the brushes play a nice 16th note medium tempo time. Mm -hmm. What's difficult about this piece is first the tempo. Nothing in that tempo range from 75 to 90 is easy. Yeah. You know, and anything that you wanna learn how to play effectively and well, you do at slow tempos. You know, yeah. you, anybody can play fast, yeah. you know, eventually. Yeah. When you say, you know, <laughs> I can run a 20 mile marathon right now if I start by 50 feet a day. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's gonna take me a while, but I will be able to do it. You'll get right? through it. But, you know, playing uh, in, a, in those slow to slow medium tempos, 
those are really difficult because there's there's just enough space to cause problems. You mm -hmm. know, it, it, you can't quite fill it up. You know. So you're listening for the long note. You're feeling the long. Yeah, notes. I want to feel the long notes. Watch what I do in the melody. Listen to you guys. Probably everybody knows this song. It's a very mm -hmm. popular yeah. song. So we thought we'd choose it. Um, I play the actual notes that he's singing and the actual melody, and then play the time. And then there's moments where I go to a beat maker or a groove maker role, mm -hmm. right? It's say somebody's playing a piano solo or, but in still you'll hear me react in that way. And, and the key component is this is a 16th note feel at this tempo and I have to have a really good reason to play something besides 16th notes. I love that. <laughs> you I know what I mean? That's so right. You yeah. know, get, give me a reason to play a triplet and jack this feel up. Like, yeah. I got to have a really good reason. You know, maybe there is one coming. I don't know. Right. But at the end of the day, my job is to get these 16th notes up on the on the train tracks and keep it moving. So cool. let's check that let's, out. Let's do it. Okay. And while he's looking for that, guys, make sure you download the song, give it a try yourself. And um, this is why we chose this song. It's a nice slow tempo and it can... It's a great way to practice all these concepts. You'll remember me when the west wind moves upon the fields of Bali. You'll forget the sun in his jealous sky As we walk in the fields of gold So she took her love for the gaze a while Upon the fields of barley In his arms she fell as her hair came down in 
Very well played. Thank you. There's a lot of space in that song. There's a lot yeah. of space, and I'm hearing it, you know, ba, boom, ba. And you can hear in the melody, uh, uh, <laughs> You can hear exactly what I was talking about mm -hmm. in the Beyond the Sea thing. And, and I mean, I think once you, you, you start to recognize that those things are happening, you're going to hear that in music you've been listening to. Because yeah. I think great music encompasses that. I, you know, I think people really do it naturally. Yeah. You know, I mean, you were talking about Neil Peart earlier. I, I said, you know, I think one of the reasons that he orchestrated such great drum parts was he was very cognizant of what was about to happen lyrically because he wrote the lyrics. Right. So he's, he's he knows what they're trying to portray in this song. Mm -hmm. So what he chooses to do in those parts works with that story. Hmm. And, sense, and that's yeah. really important that you're, you're aware of that. I mean, bad music is, it's hard to do it. But great music <laughs> You know, it's yeah. easier to do it, but you need to do it all the time the best that you can. Right. I mean, show, show us some more um, a pop example. You have another tune uh, that you brought to, to show us here, and um, it's the same kind of concept, but it's with a different song, um, a different approach. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, you know, there's two things. One, you can you can hear that there's a really wide dynamic contrast in what I'm trying to do, mm -hmm. and. Understand that dynamics are not loud and soft. Dynamics are the contrast between loud and soft, mm -hmm. right? Because your soft and my soft could be different, mm -hmm. right? I could do it here and this could be yours, right? Yeah. Or it's the contrast that's the most important. What you don't want to do is go check this out, it's really quiet. And then this one's really medium. And then this one's really loud, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's not it. This is soft, medium. There's contrast. And I think one of the things that's most important, my friend um, Corky Siegel, who's a great harmonica player, wrote an amazing book about dynamics. And one of the first things, things that he said in the book that really struck me was, do you even know what your dynamic range is? Do you know what your soft is or what your loud is and how to stab it? Out like I want a mezzo forte. I, I want a, a you know a piano. Mm -hmm. I want forte. I want. Where is that? Right. You know, in yeah. your playing, where is that stick height? What's going on? You know, with that, and what is that range that you're using? So, for me, I try to make the range as much as possible because it's very listenable and it's very communicative when there's a lot of dynamics. Mm -hmm. you know? And I'll give you a great example of that. I'm doing this really quick and then we'll move on with the song, but you know, here's a great example of that. Just take one fill that you know. It could, even, it could be the worst fill that you know, like, you know. <laughs> you know like yeah. the worst fifth grade drum fill ever. Yeah. But, and, but you know, you go like this, okay, here's that fill, three, four, What's horrible about that? It's in time, mm -hmm. it's voiced okay, mm -hmm. but what's horrible is there's no dynamic contrast. So it's, it doesn't, it's not very listenable. Yeah. So if I just take that fill, which is hand-to-hand -hand 16th notes, and I move accents through different positions, I can literally create a thousand drum fills out of that horrible fifth grade stage band fill. Okay, right? yeah. So let's, let's just accent the first one. Two of them. And the second one. I, mean, I can sit here and move accents around all day, mm -hmm. but all of a sudden, when I'm playing that, uh, okay, now it doesn't sound so horrible. Totally anymore. different. Film. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Big time. Right, so there's a great example of step one, know your dynamic range, 
think about what is soft and what is loud and what certain components need to be those things to communicate what you're trying to say. And never, ever, ever play anything that doesn't have some dynamic arc. Hmm. Because there's our, our, remember this thing? never sounds good when there's no dynamic arc in it. Right. It just doesn't. I don't care if it's super Mr. Incredible fast. Yeah. It it's doesn't sound good. It's got to have some life in it. Right. Yeah. And and one of the things that we forget about and Adam Nussbaum told me this one time, you know, what's the first thing you hear when you play an instrument? You know, it's sound. Mm -hmm. Like I want to hear something sound good. 13 against 9 it doesn't sound good. Mm -hmm. It's cool, it's very difficult to play, I get it. I love working on that stuff, and when I play the Indian gig that we do, we play stuff like that, but, yeah. but it's gotta be purposeful, and at the end of the day, most of it doesn't really sound very good. Yeah. You know, and even that's in contact key. sometimes. Yeah, even, even in context. I say sometimes, you know, <laughs> you know, drummers learn that stuff and then they, they write music to that so they yeah. can play it. You know so what I mean? It, and I said it kind of all ends up sounding like R two D two solo record. You know? <laughs> I love it's it. It's a lot of beeps and clicks and yeah. whatnot. <laughs> but um, you know, get dynamics get that range soft and loud in everything that you do, every single thing that you work on, double bass stuff, anything, where is the big and the small parts? That's the first thing. The second thing is we gotta gain control of those sustained values. So I'm, I'm thinking about that and we took a tune, like we were talking about a, one of the hit songs I played, so we took one of those tunes from Nelly. Mm -hmm. That was a, was a big hit song. So um, in that song, the producers came to me and I've told this story several times, but they came to me with this demo of this drum machine going boom, bop, ba boom, bop, ba boom, really for the whole song. Yeah. And went, okay, we want you to play that beat, make it feel better, but we need the chorus to really explode and be big, but we kind of really love that beat, so don't play anything different. But if you in the you can make it really much you know bigger in the chorus and explode, that would be great. Sure. Okay. You know, and I'm yeah. like, okay, well, <laughs> other than throw a hand grenade at the council, I don't know how I'm going to explode this chorus <laughs> anymore by not playing anything different. You know what yeah. I mean? So, I I I I use some of these tools that we're talking about um, in the verse. What I did is I I took the groove boom bat boom got go go which is 16th notes mm -hmm. and i turned it into uh 16th note triplets all right for the chorus in the verse or in the verse so what that does is it puts less space between the note right cuz a 16th note is here a 16th note triplets a little closer together mm -hmm. right so that adds a little bit of urgency to it right it puts a little bit on top and a little bit of urgency to it so now rather than this, this it's You can, yeah. I'm playing the same eighth note thing here, because yeah. remember, eighth notes is the, thir the first and fourth note of a group of 16th note triplets. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, dig it, 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 just eighth notes, mm -hmm. right? So when I close that up a little bit, now there's like this little sense of urgency mm. in there. Yeah. When I release that, feeling of release because I went back to the 16th notes again. So the chorus you go into 16th. Right, I go to 16th huh. notes. And then the other thing I do is I lay it back a tiny bit with longer sustain. So here's my short sustain. Right? I'm hearing it like that. In the chorus I'm hearing it. I'm hearing that bigger, longer right. sustain. Right. So the combination of playing that a little bit bigger and it lays back in time a little bit when you have all that length on there, you know, and that change of feel, I added one more bass drum note and it opens up and turns into a whole nother thing. So. And that song went on to sell millions. Nine million, yeah, That's a lot. Insane. Yeah. A, a huge amount, yeah. And it's really cool hearing 
the direction that you were given by a producer of such a huge song and then how you interpreted that yeah. and articulated it on the kit. Yeah. And with just that slight little change, it, everything changed, everything well, blew up for the chorus. It, it did, and, and the lucky <clears throat> part was it wasn't a huge song when we did it, it was just, you know, it was just a new song that nobody knew was gonna do anything, of course, so of course, yeah. I, feel, I felt uh, you know, confident enough to mess around with it. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's a little bit easier sometimes when, when you, you don't know it's gonna be a big hit, you right. know, than when it is a big hit, and then you go, oh no, like the second album, everybody's a little bit more nervous, like, oh yeah, we sold nine million, what are we gonna do? We gotta you know? make that, better. or whatever, so you know. More. So well, anyway, uh, let's do that. You let's hear do it. That? This is a Nelly Furtado song called I'm Like a Bird, mm -hmm. and I um, hope you enjoy it. It's from a record called Whoa Nelly back in the uh, mid to early 2000s, I think. Very yeah. cool. Okay. And that's for sure You'll never, ever fade You're lovely, but it's not for sure I won't ever change And though my love is great Thank you. That's great, yeah. It sounds simple, 
Like if you hear it on the radio, you it's just not, like, well, it's not simple. It's such a subtle movement from 16 notes to 16 note triplets, but the fact that it, that creates, it, you know, people always ask, how do you build that tension, or how how do you you know push and pull and and create feeling on the drums, and it's subtle little differences like that. It is, and you, you know, know what? I think the most important thing about this is just opening your ears up to listen for those things. Mm -hmm. You know that you mm -hmm. hear. You hear those things going by, and all of a sudden, playing a basic rock beat doesn't sound so basic anymore. No doubt. The notes are basic, but yeah. when you implement all those other things, where's your dynamics? What's supposed to be accented? Where's the length of the notes? Where's the high notes, the low notes, the timber of things? You know, Where are you positioning that in time based upon how you're hearing that sustain? Mm -hmm. Can you do it consistently? You know, and all of a sudden it. it starts to narrow down who can do these things, you know. There's a reason why there's a couple huge cats that keep getting the calls, you know, and that are doing all these, you know, you talk to these drummers that come out on Drumio and they're playing for so many different artists. It's like, well, save some for the other drummers, but right. there's a reason why they get called all the time. <laughs> well, the, the components that they work on uh, for their, their, their toolkit are the ones that help execute music, you know, mm -hmm. right? And so the lesson is, there's a great drummer, and then there's a great musician who plays the drums. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's key, because if you want to play with other musicians and play a lot of different music or play music at all, you have to learn to get the stuff in your toolkit that work with that particular language, yeah. right? Because the language of drumming is different. Totally, and, and, and like you said too, you're not harping on the practice for facility. Oh no, no, we need that. You need that, yeah. but it's just that missing link, that gap that a lot of drummers have these days. And you mentioned a good point, you know, like nowadays we're all YouTube drummers, we're focusing on, on you know, basement, playing our songs on our electronic kit or to our play-alongs, and you know, we're not branching out and playing. I'm not saying that to everyone, but I'm just seeing it a lot myself. You know, yeah. you're, you're not going out and playing shows all the time, and the shows, yeah. a lot of shows have dried up. I mean, there's a lot of reasons behind that. There's a lot of reasons, yeah. But you know, someone will play the shows, so yeah. it, it, it might as well might be as you. Might as well be you, exactly. <laughs> you know, someone will do this. And uh, you know, the, the electronic drums are a good point. They're hard because the dynamic range of those is so much smaller. Mm -hmm. So that you have to just understand that if you're playing an electronic instrument, you know, movement and the understanding of time positioning and sustain and those th those can all be done, but the dynamic range can't really be done. Mm -hmm. And then the articulation and nuance of things that's happening, you know, certainly brushes can't happen, but I mean, yeah. you, you can see like the rim shot versus the center of the drum versus, yeah. you know, the edge of the ride up into here. And, you know, this ride symbol has a hundred different sounds on it, yeah. not three. Yeah, like the you know the company goes no, there's three. There's an edge and a center and a crown. It's like no, there's not. Yeah, there's, there's 97 a, more exactly. in there that I can get out of it. So, well, tons of great information, and we're not even done. We got one more couple or a couple more things to do here. But I just wanted to thank you for coming out again. My pleasure. It's great to be here. Yeah, and um, watch this lesson again, everyone, and just listen to what's going through Russ's head when he's creating these parts and how he's drumming and why he is such a musical drummer. I mean, you guys can get there too, and um, it's those little nuances that sometimes you don't think about. It's true. It's um, true. But we do need to have sixth gear, though. Yeah, I like you do. having sixth gear. You know, you do. I don't. I'm not one of those guys that goes, oh, just. You know, you don't need chops at all, and you just got to play. Of course, yeah. I mean, you need to have something to say on the instrument, in my opinion. Like, there has to be a reason to hire you. Totally. You know, you I want your opinion musically, but I also want you to add something and do something. You know. Totally. You just gotta, just gotta do it in a way that that makes sense. Again, I think the grab bag way is probably the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Just to say, oh, I'm gonna play fives here or sevens here, and then you're just looking for a place to put that. Yeah. Versus looking at some things. And we're gonna talk about how to develop that, I think, in the, in the other course stuff that we're gonna to shoot too. Absolutely, so if you guys wanna check more of that out, come to Dromeo.com and sign up with us. You get a free trial at Dromeo.com slash trial. Um, and you can see more of Russ. There's gonna be some great videos that we're, we're gonna be t filming with him tomorrow. And um, again, huge thanks to Mapex, Dave Lawrence. I think he's back there somewhere. Thanks so much for showing this kit to us and letting us hear it. Uh, you'll hear more about all that later. Um, but before we wrap up, set us up with this last tune you're gonna play for us and um, how this works in a completely different genre. Yeah, well I thought, I thought it would be interesting to play something that's completely different than what we were talking about. Those were 16th bass or maybe 16th note triplet. So let's do something triplet bass. Like we'll take like a big band piece, okay. or big band arrangement. Um, so there's a, there's a Yellow Jackets arrangement um, that, that I've, I play a bunch. And um, in this, you know, you're, now, now you're way up tempo. 
All right, so the, the distance between the notes for the, the, the timekeeping, that's not so much of a, now we're just trying to keep it at that tempo. Yeah. Right, now we've, we've crossed over from, it's really hard to keep it this slow to like, it's really hard to keep it this fast. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I hear, I hear these tempos in bigger pieces. So instead of hearing one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, I hear one, two, three, four, one, okay. two. Okay, that's, a, that's how I, I, I hear it and then hopefully it, my body executes it. But um, you're gonna hear the same thing. You'll hear how I, you know, I switch, I always switch cymbals here with this kind of stuff because you know, I'll go to a sizzle cymbal for uh, uh, an instrument like the trombone solo or something that'll that'll fill a little bit of high end space with the sizzles mm -hmm. while there's a low instrument soloing, um, it changes changes the mood a little bit to have sizzles in the cymbal. Um, uh, for the trumpets, you know, I stay on on this cymbal and keep the high the high clarity there to support those things. Um, I'm playing the hits with the band, and then of course, with this style, and with all styles, really, you have a choice of do I hit the rhythm that the band is playing, or do I set up the rhythm, filling the space leading into that rhythm that the band is playing, Yeah. to help them understand. Because think, think about it, a lot of people don't realize this, you think about a sax player sitting there waiting to hit a note on beat two, three bars later, he's just kind of sitting there like this going, you know, and then he's got to go boop. <laughs> so anything you can do to help set him up, get up, boop, get it, get it, get it, boop, boop. Yeah. Okay. He loves you for that. Totally, you know, because yeah. he's going. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that because you know what he doesn't want to hear is go blah 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 there's a, there's a moment in there where we trade eights at this tempo. It's kind of like trading forwards, meaning the band plays eight, and then I play eight, and the play, band plays eight. But then there's a section where I play a whole chorus, meaning the whole form of the song. So one deeper level of this, and the next thing to work on, we were talking about learning the melody and playing the melody, but the next thing is learning the form of the song by knowing how many bars are, is the A section, how many bars is the B section. Is, it, is the A played twice, like A, A, B, and then A again? That's a jazz, a standard jazz form. Mm -hmm. How many bars is that equal? Because if I say to you, okay, Dave, take two choruses, you have to be able to play that in time, knowing where you're at in the piece. And everything you play should be articulating or telling a story about the A section. Mm, right. right, and right. then when it goes to the B section, something should change because now this is a story about the B section. Mm -hmm. And right, so there's there's what we're talking about thinking deeper about the music. One more step: Where am I in this overall composition? Am I doing something that is uh, derivative of that particular section of the song? So we, what we don't want to do is go. Here's the drum solo, and the drum solo has no relevance to anything that happened previous right. to it. Yeah. Right. But, yeah. You know. So that's the problem. And a lot of times you you'll hear that on bands where, you know, the, you'll you'll hear a jazz band play or something, and then there's a beautiful sax solo and it's all working, and then here comes the drums and it's louder. Yeah. Like way louder than the song. Right. Way yeah. more bombastic. And you go, well, man, the band was here. Why was your solo here? Mm -hmm. Like you know, I mean, it could get there, but what made it? do that How besides get, your yeah. inability to play quiet. Yeah. You know what I mean? So those are things to, to think about as well. I recommend working on all exercises at between 75 and 90 BPM and between mezzo piano and mezzo forte. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can play something at mid to low tempos and mid to low volumes, you can play it. And, right. and that means fast double bass stuff. You, you can't just play that stuff only loud. Yeah. Yeah. You know, or it's only usable in that one situ situation. So. Well, the, the hardest thing, even on the simplest grooves that we have to teach, is 60 BPM. Yeah, and that's when we always mess up. Absolutely, yeah. and I and I keep track. I have a little lesson book. I keep track of when I'm working on stuff every single day. I have it in my bag. I mark down. Okay, I'm working on this. It's these tempos, mm -hmm. but I always start in those tempos and and get through that first, and then try to speed it up. Great so. tip. Great tip. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. you can okay. play this piece. Thank you. Show us this piece. This is a song. What's the song called? 
It's called Run For Your Life. Run For Your Life. Um, again, thanks for watching, everyone. Hope you got a lot out of this. You might have to watch it two or three times. There's so many great little tidbits in there. Russ, you are a professional through and through, man. Not oh. only are you, you are very articulate on the kit, but you're very articulate in how you teach things. Your demonstrations are spot on, and I was just enthralled the whole lesson. So. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Thank you so well, much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. You guys are awesome, man. It's an incredible, incredible facility and staff. So Thank you. It's golden. Thank you. Yeah, well, you're always <laughs> welcome here. And like I said, if you're ever bored, uh, you're, you can come over here for a month and we can teach you lessons every single day because you have <laughs> okay. a wealth of knowledge. All right. Thanks, everyone. You Check Russ Miller out on his website, russmiller.com, at official Russ Miller on Facebook, and RMI Sticks That's right. on Instagram. Enjoy awesome. the song. Thank you.